الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاميم والكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه في ليلة مباركة إنا كنا منذرين فيها يفرق كل أمر حكيم أمرا من عندنا إنا كنا مرسلين صدق الله العظيم وعن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها قالت فقدت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات ليلة فخرجت أطلبه فإذا هو بالبقيع رافعا رأسه إلى السماء فقال يا عائشة أكنت تخافين أن يحيف الله عليك ورسوله قلت وما لي من ذلك ولكني ظننت أنك أتيت بعض نسائك فقال الله عز وجل ينزل ليلة النصف من شعبان إلى السماء الدنيا فيغفر لأكثر من عدد شعر غنم كلب رواه الترمذي Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, today, as we all know, is Laylat Nisf Sha'ban, middle of the month of Sha'ban, also known as Laylatul Bara'ah or Shabe Barat, as it is known in the subcontinent and other places where. Uh, non-Arabic speaking communities are using that term and this is one celebration which will not be found anywhere in the Middle East. Nobody celebrates Laylat Nisf Shaban or shab barat for the simple reason that as we read in the Holy Quran Surah Al-Dukhan, where certain verses which I have just recited, let me give you the translation of those verses. It is, by the way, Surah number 44, verses 1 to 5. By the book that makes things clear, we send it down during a blessed night. For we wish to warn against evil. In that night is made distinct every affair of wisdom. By command from our presence. For we send revelation. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about. This Layla Mubaraka. Layla Mubaraka means a blessed night. But if you go through a tafasir, the interpretation of the Holy Quran, the most prominent one of them, you will find that the vast majority of the scholars and the vast majority of the interpreters of the Holy Quran, al mufassirun they do not agree, although there are like Akrima radiallahu anhu, his call is that these verses are about the Laylat an Nisf min Sha'ban for Shabi Barat. But it's a very, you know, rare view of only few individuals who give that meaning to these verses. Actually, these verses, according to majority of the Mufassirin, and the scholars are about Laylatul Qadr, that is Shab Qadr or night of power which falls during the holy month of Ramadan. You know, 
and that night is uh, known to be according to majority of these scholars on the 27th night of the month of Ramadan and according to some narrations and hadith uh, sayings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you should be seeking the night of power in the last 10 days odd nights meaning 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th and 29th night so fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim as it is said or inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qad there is tremendous relationship between these two words and between these surahs you know coming from the whole quran and obviously it is very well known uh, in certain communities that this is a very blessed night so i have investigated the matter the, the whole matter and i came to know that the vast majority of the narrations regarding this nights do not uh, hold that status which we can call as an authentic status uh, or sahih or mutawatir ahadith I have recited uh, one hadith in front of you. Let me give you the translation of that. That is uh, the hadith which is reported by Imam Tirmidhi. You know, Imam Tirmidhi is one of the, you know, collectors of the hadith. As you all know that we know six books and we find them to be the most authentic collections of hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those six books are Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Nasai, and Abu Dawud. These are the six most authentic collections. But the ahadith or the sayings and the tradition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not limited to those six. We have many other books, uh, Al-Bayhaqi, Al-Tabrani and all those were many, many books where you will still find the authentic sayings and traditions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, about this night, Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha is speaking about that when I was sleeping and I look for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam around me, I did not find him next to me. And that was uh, most probably her turn you know, and I would like to bring to your notice one uh, uh, interjection here to remind you that in the West, in the last hundred years, 60,000 books about Islam were written by non-Muslims. 60,000 books. I'm not talking about the books which are writ written by Muslims. Only by non-Muslim, vast majority of them are from Western countries. And they have everything but Islam. In those books, one of the major charges against Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, na'udhu billahi min dhalik, they say that the Prophet ﷺ was a womanizer and sex maniac. This is what they say in there. I'm mentioning that because we have lots of youngsters here. You might hear those kind of things in your classes, in your colleges. So you will be well equipped to give the proper answer to that. Because in my classes, I teach, alhamdulillah, in four community colleges and in uh, Berkeley, in GTU, Graduate Theological Union as well. And we have these discussions all the time. And it's a very important thing our children should know and should be educated about. 
So when they say that uh, and they ask question about it, I ask them, you tell me, suppose if somebody is womanizer and sex maniac, when that person is sexually active? So they say between 16 and 30, 35. What do you think about it? When? Any opinion? When would a person be active? If huh? Choose young age. Young age. Okay, that's number one. And we'll go for sweet sixteens, younger women. Am I right? What happens? Look into the realities of the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he was twenty-five years old. And before that, he never married and he was, he was not one of those who have any unlawful relationship with anyone. He was approached by Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is one of the two people, non-prophets who received the greetings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam came and said to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending his salam to Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and asking, is she pleased with me? I am well pleased with her. That was the status of Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And when she asked for the hand of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was a very famous business lady who was sought in marriage by many influential leader of Mecca, but she decided not to accept any one of them because she was already married twice. And she was a widow. She gave birth to three children before that. And she was 40 years old. And this marriage took place. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with her for next 25 years. In that 25 years, he never married another woman. When Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha died, she was 65 years old, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 50 years old. After that, after a few years, the message was rapidly spreading especially after the migration to Medina. And women were as many as men, half of the community. It's not only men who have the questions, women had their questions and the nature of their questions mostly was private kind of questions. And a prophet cannot deal with a woman on one-to-one -one basis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take number of wives to be the agencies who will be taking the questions of the women and bringing to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and bring back the answers to them. Out of 11 wives of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the only wife who was virgin was Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha. All the others were either divorced or widows. And one of them was so old that there was no physical intimacy between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Her name was Sayyida Rawda, Sayyida Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha who gave her turn to Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha. So, a person who is active between that age, then I asked my student that who, he was with one wife who was 15 years older than him for 25 years and after that, 
you know, for uh, next few years there was no, and then when uh, he married other, there were, say, between 54 and coming few years, and that was when the message was like is described in Surah number 110. You see people entering the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in multitude. Okay. That was the time when he was instructed. And when Prophet sallallahu died, there were nine behind those agencies. And after the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most prominent companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say that Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha is such a powerful religious and Islamic source that whenever we have any problem in understanding Islam, we go to Ummul Mu'mineen, Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, and she has an answer for everything. And that was the secret when he, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was instructed to marry her in young age so, so she can absorb everything, all the message and all the knowledge of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this is what happened. Like you may have heard philosophers saying, you give me a child before he is seven and he'll be mine forever. You know, that is the educational process which took place. Anyway, so this was Sayyida Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who is saying that I did not find Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa next to me. So I came out looking for him. And I found him in Jannatul Baqiya. You know, Jannatul Baqiya is a maqbara or graveyard where people are buried, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there praying for the dead in that night. This is something which is uh, authentic because it is coming from Sahih Tirmidhi, one of the most authentic collection out of six authentic collections. And it was also confirmed by uh, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi and other scholars that what we find about the Laylat Nisf Shaban, the hadith of Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha. When she came to the graveyard, he, she saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is raising her, his head towards the sky and praying. And then he talked to her, uh, asking that, well, did you think that you have lost me? Or So she said, no, 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 I was worried about. You know, a woman, of course, who is not a prophet, she may have those kind of, uh, you know, limitations or shortcomings. You know, so you have heard the beautiful story from Surah Al-Tahreem, Surah number 66. That story tell us about the wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they were the kind of individuals and human beings who had those limitations which all of us have. You know, let me tell you that story. It's a very interesting one where uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he had these number of wives, his habit was to go and visit each and every single one of them between Asr and Maghrib every single day. And then after Maghrib and after Aisha, he will go to the one whose turn is that night. But why does he visit every day between Asr and Maghrib? To find out if they have any immediate need, you know. In today's term, we can say, got milk, yeah. <laughs> have everything, you need anything, or so on, to find out or provide that, that need. And obviously, as you know, that Islamic marriage means that the husband and wife fill each other's heart with happiness and try to find out each other's expectations and fulfill them without being asked. 
So Sayyida Zainab bint Jahsh radiyallahu ta'ala anha knew about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he loved honey drink. So every single day when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will arrive to Sayyida Zainab bint Jahsh radiyallahu ta'ala anha, the honey drink will be ready. Now it was so frequently done, so regularly done that every other wife came to know. So Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha says to Sayyida Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha that, okay, so he must be drinking the honey drink there, you know. So when he comes, we what we are going to do, we will do this. Yes. Of course, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was such a clean person. He was particularly offended to any body order or any kind of bad smell or anything. You know, he was the best example and role model for the entire humankind with the witness, with the glo in the glorious words of the Holy Quran. Laqad kana lakum fi hasana. He is the role model in everything. So what happened? When he came, they did this. When they did this, the Prophet said, I did not eat or drink anything that smells bad. All I did is I had a honey drink and wallahi by God, if you don't like the honey, the honey is haram on me from today. It is unlawful on me. Even a prophet does not have the authority to make something halal, haram or haram, halal. The surah number 66, the name of the surah is At-Tahrim. At-Tahrim means to make something lawful, unlawful. And the first two verses are my point of reference. Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, lima tuharrimu ma ahallallah. Why do you take something that Allah made lawful as unlawful? And the most important glorious words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing, He said, Tabtaghi mardata aswajik? You seeking the good pleasure of your wives? Wallahu ghafoor rahim Allah is oft forgiving, merciful. Qad faradallahu lakum tahillata aymanikum. And it is obligatory upon you to break these kind of oaths where haram and halal are involved, where you make something uh, lawful, unlawful. And that is according to Islamic jurisprudence. So Prophet ﷺ broke his uh, oath. And of course, there is a, you have to, you know that, what is the kafara compensation for breaking an oath, either you have to free a slave because Islam never ever wanted slavery to continue, therefore in many different ways the freedom was given to them, or feed ten people, or fast for three days. But that's not my question. My question here is, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named that surah as At-Tahrim and kept those two verses which we have to recite up to the Day of Judgment to remind us that how far Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went in pleasing his wives and in saving his families and so on. The word Tabtaghi Mardata as Wajik is why? Because the Prophet is role model and it has two things here. You must go as much as possible as long as you are not making lawful unlawful. You have to go and save because it is, you know, a sulhu khair according to Islamic uh, instruction. Reconciliation is always a better option recommended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if somebody has that kind of uh, situation, this uh, story will help them and I just wanted to interject. So Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha was the one who was involved in that story as well. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, she said to him that I thought you are going to another wife. That's why I got worried and I came looking for you. 
you know. Then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, and she's reporting that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down in this night to the sky that is facing this world. Sama'i dunya. You know, that is called. We have three, we have seven levels of these skies. So, one is the highest one by near the throne or arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the seventh one. And the first one is facing this world which we can see on his soul to that sky. And then, of course, فَيَغْفِرُ And he will provide the maghfirah and forgiveness for the people more than the sheep of the tribe of Kalb. Tribe of Kalb was famous about having tremendous, tremendous amount of sheep, you know. So and if you take go and count the hair of a sheep, you, you won't be able to count. That means unlimited forgiveness is spoken about in this uh, particular night. So what is proven in this night is the visiting of Qabristan or Maqbara or you can say graveyard by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لِيَسْتَغْفِرَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ to ask forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for believing men and women وَالشُّهَدَى and for the martyrs. In this night also there is a hadith but that is not the most authentic hadith which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide in this night about the people that who is going to die this uh, this year and who is going to be living up to the next year and so on you know tuqta'u ajalun nas min sha'ban ila sha'ban from this month to the next sha'ban in the next year but that is not and also there are a hadith which speak about that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down as we have learned from the hadith of Sayyida Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha that means at that time the angels are instructed to call upon the people. Ala min mustaghfirin fa'aghfiru la Is there anyone who is seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so I can forgive the person. Ala min mustarziqin fa'arzuqa Is there anyone who want to ask for the sustenance? So I can provide the sustenance. And it goes on in many different ways. Again here the research scholars and the authentic information is wanted to come and watch you because for last three days Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking about you that you are going to go to Jannah to the garden of paradise. So I came down to find out what do you do? What is this extraordinary act which you are doing so I can do that and I can be like you. So the man told me he says that Whatever you have seen, that's it. So I turned my back. I was about to leave. He called me back. He said, come back, come back. One thing which you could not see, let me tell you that. He said, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the training of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the moment I became Muslim, I always try to keep my heart healthy. What is the meaning? 
The meaning is, as it is said in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse number 165, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ Those who believe they are strongest in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I do not let any impurities enter my heart. Jealousy is a impurity. Ill feeling is impurity. Enmity is impurity. All those bad things I never let. And if I have any ill feeling in my heart, I will never go to bed unless I go to the person. I say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I keep my heart pure and free so it can be the seat of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I learned that the purity of, of heart is the greatest thing. Or Abdullah ibn Umar says, I screamed and I shouted, this is the one, this is the one which made you that important that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave that forecast that you will be going to Jannah, nothing else, you see. It is internal purity has to be reflected uh, with your external action that comes from, the, and the heart is the seed. You know, we have to take care of four things. But we only take care of one thing. That is our physical body. You see, we keep on feeding it. We keep on wearing makeup. We keep on beautifying ourselves. We go a long way in picking and choosing and matching our dress and everything. But we have to give equal attention to four things in us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept. The first one is spirit, ruh. That is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can only nurture that by connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest thing of that is remembrance of Allah and Allah says in verse number 14, surah number 20, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ For my remembrance, establish the regular prayer. Second thing is your body. That is a container of your ruh. See? So make sure you don't let any haram enters your body because if you allow that, you will lose the ability to firmly stand for the truth. Third thing is your intellect. See? Because the first commandment of Islam is Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read, educate yourself, and you have to continue to fill your mind with the education. But what kind of education? Ilm and nafi and beneficial education. See? Beneficial. What is the meaning? The whole purpose of life of a Muslim, no matter in what profession you are, everything is Islamic. We don't have anything secular. As long as it is beneficial education and you are trying to take the humanity one step forward, even if it is a very small step, you have fulfilled your duty and responsibility. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that I have given you the whole universe for under your disposal. It's your duty to find out the secrets and make this place better for yourself and for coming generations. So, your mind, your mind is the third thing. What is the fourth thing? Your heart, which is the seat of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I created the time and space. Time and space cannot take me. Yet, Allah lives in the heart of a believer. That is the kind of love so let me conclude with the four people in these blessed night in general and about this night four kind of people will not be forgiven one is the person who is taking intoxicants drugs of any kind whether they are alcohol liquid form 
powder form, leaf form, pill form, any kind, that person will not be forgiven. And unfortunately, we Muslim can contribute to the well-being of America, where a minimum number of the drunk people and those who have very serious drinking problem are 55 million. 55 million suffering in this country. That is one way we can contribute. Allah will not forget that. Second, a person who disobeys his parents. Okay. But disobedience in one way allowed. If the parents ask you to commit shirk and assign partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are not allowed to listen to it. Surat Luqman, Surah number 31. Verse number 13 and 14, you can read there when Allah says, don't listen to your parent if they ask you to do share, but still, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ Give them the companionship on the basis of ma'roof. Ma'roof is more than justice. You have a duty and responsibility to look after even your non-Muslim parents by comforting them and providing their needs. Volume. I mean, the time is uh, almost over. Otherwise, with each one, I would have told you some stories. Volume. A person who is wrongfully treating other people. Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 279, La wala tuzlamun. You don't do any injustice to anyone. And you don't allow anyone to do injustice to you. This is not only doing injustice to others is haram in Islam, but also to be victim is haram. People are supposed to stand for their rights. People are supposed to speak for their rights. Don't just sit back and be indifferent about it. No, you have to stand for your rights. That's why the Quran says, at the beginning of the sixth juz, La yuhibbu Allahu al-jara bis-sui min al-qawl illa man zulim. What does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow to be spoken loudly the evil except by a victim of aggression. Illa man zulim. Only Muslim can speak about that. So, and, and the principle of Islamic Sharia, one of the principles is la darara wa la dirar. What does it mean? Meaning you do not harm anyone and you do not let anyone harm you. And the fourth one is the one who cuts the relationship. You say to your brother, oh, I will never talk to you. Or to your father, or to your mother, or to your friends. In Islam, we have three levels of relationship. The first one is blood relatives, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 23. You cannot cut that. If you cut that, you are equivalent to the one who is spreading mischief in the land. وَيَقْتَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلَ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْحَارِ Number two, faith relatives. Faith relatives, believers. Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah 49, verse number 10. Innama al-mu'minuna ikhwa. All the believers are one brotherhood. If there is a dispute, faslihu bayna akhawaykum. You have to reconcile between any two individuals who are Fighting and verse number nine is group. Five, you know, a group of the believers if they are fighting each other. The whole ummah has a duty and responsibility to bring peace to them. And the third one is Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number thirteen. 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the entire humankind is one family coming from Adam and Eve and every single Muslim is instructed and commanded لِتَعَارَفُوا Allah says I have divided you into the nations and tribes so you can know each other. Ta'aruf cannot happen one way. It is reciprocation of when you go and find out about the people, they will be finding out about you. And when we do that, we can remove the hatred and fear from the people. That is the recognition. And that will make you a person of taqwa. And a person of taqwa is higher in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sorry the time is over. I love to speak to you, inshallah, some other occasion. The time is over. If anybody has any question, I would rather prefer to take your question and give you the answer instead of going and having the refreshment. You can have it after Isha prayer. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is an age-long uh, dispute and there are many different uh, stories about it. Okay. Let me put it in a very different way. When Prophet wasallam was raised as a prophet, if you go back to the history, you will find that Everywhere in the world, the normal behavior of the human being was a woman was considered to be fit for marriage as soon as she enters her monthly cycles. That is what the qualification for a woman. Okay, That is one thing. The second thing is you cannot judge anyone by the standard of 21st century going back to the 7th century. Number three, everybody in those days, the women were so abused that people had multiple wives, concubines, slave girls and all that Islam came and Islam is the only religion which gave the limitation to all those things. So coming back to Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, I can only tell you one story which happened with me. The first time when I came from London to America to lead the Tarawi prayer in MCA of Santa Clara Masjid, you know, that was in 1983. A person who came to pick me up from the airport, his name was Majid. And with him, he has a daughter whose name was Majida. They still live in Santa Clara. I hope he wouldn't mind uh, me giving you his name so you can even confirm from him. I, I was really surprised. He asked me, Brother Khalid, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, can you tell me what is the age of my daughter? She was fully grown. I said, she must be between 18 or 20. So he said, she is nine years old. She is nine years old. What is the meaning of that? I said, why are you asking me that? He said, I just asked because there is a lot of you and cry about Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. I brought this evidence, my own daughter, she is nine years old, look at her, nobody except when I tell them that she is nine years old, everybody give her the age, 18 to 20. So, so there are some girls who are grown up like that. 
but not it's not that question it's the question is no marriage of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam took place without receiving the commandments and instructions from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as i touched the point probably the most important reason for sayyida aisha the only virgin whom the prophet married is preservation of the knowledge of the prophethood of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, because islam has raised the status of women in such a way that she becomes the source individual even for the men who were the most prominent companions of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is taking to that high status and providing that that education how it turns people so i hope it might satisfy you might not satisfy you that is my answer to that there are narrations which go between 9 years to 17 years which is speaks that he was when the marriage was consummated you know uh, some says uh, 17 years but the majority of the view is for 9 years but this is without any shadow of doubt that she was fully grown and she was a woman she was not a child she was in her monthly cycle and everything okay okay to mujhe ishara kiya gaya dua karne ke liye okay let us pray to allah subhanahu wa taala alhamdulillah rabbil alamin was salatu was salam ala sayyidil mursalin wa alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in allahumma aslih lana deenana alladhi huwa ismatu amrina wa aslih lana dunyana alladhi fiha ma'ashuna wa aslih lana akhiratana alladhi ilayha ma'aduna واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide each and every one of us to fulfill our own personal responsibility towards Islam by learning the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by reading Quran in the language in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has authored in Arabic by understanding the meaning and message by implementing the teaching and by teaching somebody else the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his role model in every aspect of our day to day life may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to fulfill our responsibility in considering every single night as laylat nisf shaaban or shab e barat so we can get nearness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabbana wa taqabbal dua bi rahmatika ya arham Yes brother you have a question Yes I just want to know is um one of the books of hadith do they consider it to be authentic uh, the muwatta Yes okay. it is one of the first books Muwatta Imam Malik you see that was the first book of hadith and it is you know considered to be sahih Yes